morning from Southampton Water, where the liner Canberra, all 45,000 tons of her, back from the South Atlantic. A cruise which has lasted three months. She sailed from Southampton on Good Friday, April the 9th. And now she's back on June the 11th. And the rust is showing through her paint. That's what the South Atlantic has done to her. Although, miraculously, she has no other damage. On board, 2,000, 2,500 Royal Marines, 4-0 Commando, 4-2 Commando, and half of 4-5 Commando, back from the fighting in the Falklands. And it must be said that much of Southampton has gone down the water to bring her home. Everything's here, motor yachts, sailing yachts, ferries. Everybody who can has gone down to bring the Canberra home. And as the mist has risen this morning, so Southampton can see Canberra, and Canberra can see Southampton. And this is what every man on board has been waiting for. And on shore, their families are waiting, families of the Marines, families of the crew. And the 400 crew who went, every man of her crew volunteered to go, all 900, only 400 were needed. And their families are here, and every man on board seems to have a fan club. And the Canberra making good time. This is, after all, a military operation. Steaming up Southampton water to berth 106 in the West Docks. It's almost like the first Cunadas, the great ships arriving in the Hudson River, having crossed the Atlantic. But now, it's a wave, every bit of bunting, the 20 nautical miles around is being pressed into service. The flags are up, helicopters crossing the scene, fire ships play as the Canberra comes home. South Atlantic, 8,000 miles away, when she came under attack, under attack by the Argentine Air Force on May the 21st in San Carlos water. She soon lost her cruise liner crisp white coat. The ravages of the South Atlantic saw to that, as did the comings and goings of scores of ships, landing craft, pontoons and helicopters. But far from being the odd one out, Canberra became the favourite of the fleet. She quickly learned how to replenish at sea, keeping close convoy, go through anti-submarine manoeuvres and even to defend herself with machine guns mounted on the rails where not so long ago passengers had lolled sipping cocktails. Her new passengers caused many changes inside too, but I never found a man with a harsh word for the ship that became affectionately known as the White Whale. When those passengers left, it was for war in landing craft for HMS Fearless. They went to the assault ship two days before D-Day, and ironically it was those who stayed aboard Canberra who were saying I wouldn't be in their shoes for anything. While the Marines and Paras could only watch helplessly from ashore, Canberra was subjected to wave after wave of attacks from Argentine jets. Bombs landed close and it was later discovered that an Exocet missile had been aimed at her but had been deflected. This Mirage jet lobbed its bomb load at Canberra, but that day and for the rest of the campaign her luck was in. The jets that caused such havoc amongst the warships missed the Canberra, although how, nobody will ever know. Another mirage and another bomb. The 21st of May will be best remembered as D-Day when the British returned to the Falklands, but for the Canberra and her crew, it was the day they survived against all the odds. Turn now to Captain Christopher Byrne, the senior naval officer on board Canberra. You were in charge of the ship, you, you took her down to the South Atlantic. Did she at any time not come up to your expectations or do as you'd wanted her to? No, I think it was the most marvellous experience and I got nothing but admiration for the way that the P&O worked with the Royal Navy in this particular operation. But it's not as anything except one would expect, because you look back at the war of 1939-45, the Merchant Navy and the Royal Navy were always very close. It was a magnificent effort by the Merchant Navy Ships Company, and I'm proud to have been on Canberra during this operation. You told me earlier that uh, she was getting quite served it and so did the men on board. 
I think that every young man who fought in this war deserves every cheer we've heard today. Brigadier Julian Thompson, you were in charge of 3 Commando Brigade throughout the campaign. What are your memories now? My memories of the, are of the young men going in and acting just like old soldiers. They were marvellous. And going into Stanley and seeing the look of joy on the faces of those exhausted guys, and they earned every bit of it. You're obviously very proud of the men. Do you yes, think that they've learned as much as perhaps you'd have expected them to on yes, a trip I have. like this? Yes, I think they have learned an enormous amount. I think they're different, actually. Was there any occasion during the campaign when we were on East Falkland that you mm. thought perhaps things weren't going to go right? Well, there was the day when I, the, the paras were on their way to Goose Green and four, five and three para were going around the north and I heard that on the news that three para were go, two para were going to go on down to Goose Green and at the same time the old uh, bombs dropped on the FDS, if you remember. And I knew they were wounded in there. I didn't know if they had all been killed. That was a bad day, actually. Bad days are over. It's the a bad very, days are over. Thanks, Evans. A yeah. very good day today. Yeah, quite, a, day. quite a welcome. Something I've never seen anything like in my life. It's fantastic. <laughs> Unbelievable. Brigadier, thank you very much I indeed. Thank you. Flag there, and the band plays on. And on board, that's just what they want to hear. This is the moment that they have all waited for and dreamed of. And it's the moment perhaps they didn't dare to dream of when they set sail. the Atlantic. People have got used to troop ships leaving Bombay and coming home, but uh, this must be the most celebrated homecoming of all, and, and don't they know? We're now here, the gangway has been brought alongside Canberra, and I think within a matter of moments we're going to get the, the first of these troops going ashore after nearly three and a half months away, and back now to Alistair. Come on. There's Brigadier Jeremy Thompson. Well, he was called by uh, the uh, commander, the man of the match, and this is the moment when he actually does come home. Absolutely, and quite rightly, he is indeed the man of the match, and behind him on his right is Colonel Malcolm Hunt, CO 40 Commando, and behind him we saw Colonel Nick Vaux, CO 42 Commando. All these men have done terrific jobs, outstanding, and there in the, to, to the rear of your screen on the left of Brigadier Thompson is uh, Major Roddy MacDonald, and Behind there, Jeremy of course, Hans. is Jeremy Hans. <laughs> Indeed. Well, all the other commanders are going to come off together. They're the first to come off. And there will be a small ceremony on the uh, dockside uh, because uh, a lot of the brass and uh, a lot of the nobility and beauty of the land are waiting to see them home. But they will be the first to come off. And after that, it will be a really planned operation. Uh, if, if I may say so, uh, Alistair, I think they're looking so anxious because they can't believe that their wives will have got through the crowd. Uh, I hope they have no other reason to be anxious. No, it's been, it's been quite a crowd. And I suppose that uh, it has been in many ways a war fought in secret. We've had very little television film until it was all over. And now at this moment they find themselves in the spotlight. Yes. And after so long sailing home, they may even be just uh, waiting a little, a little bit bored with, well, why are we waiting? Well, I'm sure they're not bored. I'm sure they're just anxious to, to, to uh, get it right, you know, and um, step ashore and meet their families. Unfortunately, uh, there will be one or two young peas there for them uh, to say hello to before they meet their wives. But it's such a lovely occasion that I'm Here they sure they're not waiting a few minutes. Here they come as another gangway goes in and the commanders now come off. There's Peter Cam Major Peter Cameron and we have Colonel Eve there. This is Colonel Paul Stevenson. He looks as if he's going to yomp his way. <laughs> Maybe he is. There they go. This is the brigade commander's party with the CEOs, do you see, walking down. Now, everything that I planned has been ruined here. There was to be a clear quayside where they met the VIPs and then their families. As you can see, everything in the heat of the moment has been ruined. <laughs> well, I don't think you really worry too much about yeah. that. 
and the hand clap does go up. They say, why are we waiting? And now we have uh, rather less uh, yes. senior people. Now here. here we have 45 commander. This is the youngest man, I suspect, 45 commander, who is being invited to go for first. As I told you earlier on, and indeed you heard, he will be part of 401 passengers going to Eastleigh and then flying up to our boats today. Great moment, a really great moment. Look at him, he's proud as punch, isn't that nice? He's as proud as punch and he hears the cheers and I think he's just a little after. Anyway, we're watching him and he's there's not. England's best supporter <laughs> with his Union Jack, Absolutely. naturally here. There we go. Well, this is better than the World Cup. Oh, it's terrific, this is success. We won and we're coming back and we're British and it's marvellous. The man who's, who's here today. That is correct, he's in the ship. Well, now, they have a very long history. Uh, in fact, I think it's said that... Uh, oh, here we are. Uh, inside the shed. This is the first man inside, and he's got the whole of this empty receiving shed, but his family are there, and he's getting the official reception. That's right. Now, there he has been met by um, an engineer-in-chief, uh, and that is Major Roddy MacDonald, who is the OC of 5-9 Independent Commander Scott. And there he's been presented by his rose, you see, by Mr. Connolly. Everybody. Right what was the most memorable moment for you? Well, it takes some beating, the reception we got coming back. Fantastic. Quite overwhelming. What's it like to have him back? Yes, me. Thank you. Welcome home. <laughs> Well, everyone gets a rose, even if he puts it in his teeth. Well, I think there's probably an opera about that. Anyhow, 4-5 Commando, uh, their fathers, uh, sailed from Warsash here in Southampton Water to Normandy. Fado, and people smiled and waved and said that they were confident. But deep down inside, they may not have known that. So, what they didn't know, but what they all expected, was that they would, in fact, take Fort Stanton. So they were in Port Stanley and now they're in Southampton. Well, I wonder what they expected to find in Port Stanley. Uh, now, of course, they know what to expect. <laughs> and they're like, this is 4-5 coming off, and they, of course, are going to fly up to a There are some people here in Southampton. I was talking to a family just last night who had come down to see their son. But by and large, their reception will be up north. And it will, with them and with all of us, there will be the recollection of the past and of those who will not return. To them, the honor and the pride of their families. To these men, honor and pride and lives to begin again. But for the moment, as all Southampton can testify, Canberra and Canberra's men are home.